The evolutionary history of mammals is long and complex, with many fascinating species having appeared and died out in the many millions of years since they originated. But mammals themselves are members of an even larger grouping known as the Cynodonts, a remarkable diverse lineage of animals that were put to the ultimate test when, 252 million years ago, they had to endure the worst mass extinction event in the history of life. The end Permian mass extinction, known by some as the infamous Great Dying, was perhaps the closest that life on Earth has come to completely ending. Between 81 and 96% of all marine species, and about 70% of terrestrial ones that were alive at this time, were wiped out, and ecosystems around the globe were devastated. The cause of this extinction appears to have been extensive volcanism that resulted in the emission of huge volumes of carbon dioxide, and caused the formation of massive lava flows that would eventually form what are today known as the Siberian Traps. The Great Dying was truly cataclysmic, it came scarily close to being the end of life on our planet, and so many lineages that had once dominated the fauna of the Permian world met their end. And yet life went on. Ecosystems recovered, species survived and evolved, and life on Earth was far from over. One of these remarkable survivors of the extinction was the Cynodont Thrinaxodon. Living just after the Permian, in the early Triassic, this is a fascinating little organism that has preserved some incredible details of prehistoric behaviour including clues as to how it, and even its mammal relatives, our ancestors, made it through the worst mass extinction event in our planet's history. Thrinaxodon has been known about for a long time, with the first specimen coming to the attention of science in 1887, when Sir Richard Owen, creator of the name Dinosauria, referred it to an animal he thought was some kind of reptile. However, in 1894 it was then reclassified as its own genus, and given the name Thrinaxodon lyrinus. Then in 1977 some very interesting discoveries about this animal were made. Based on fossils collected a few years earlier, 14 specimens found in a formation in Antarctica were confirmed to be examples of Thrinaxodon too. Although some slight differences between the number of vertebrae in the South African and Antarctic forms were found, other features confirmed that the individuals from both continents were not just members of the same family but could indeed be referred to the same species, providing some pretty ideal evidence that the continents had been joined together at this time, as part of the supercontinent Pangaea. So what was Thrinaxodon? Well, as I've already mentioned, it was a member of a group of animals called the Cynodonts, specifically an Epicynodont, so slightly more derived than some more basal members of the grouping. Cynodonts originated during the late Permian period and actually survived through to the modern day, since, as I said, mammals are a subgrouping of Cynodonts themselves. The Cynodonts were a remarkably diverse clade that actually became very successful after the end Permian extinction, and all sorts of different modes of life are known for the non-mammalian members of this group including an interesting one for Thrinaxodon itself, which we'll come to in a bit. Based on a large study of cynodont relationships to each other, Thrinaxodon is classified as an epicynodont, but is positioned just outside the eucynodonts, which includes the groups that would eventually give rise to the mammals. So, while not especially close to the true mammals themselves, Thrinaxodon is certainly along the lineage heading towards these early relatives of ours, and so this puts this taxon in an ideal position for certain implications about prehistoric mammals to be made based on studies of its anatomy and behaviours. One of the big questions to answer when studying any extinct animal is, of course, what did they look like when they were alive? Well, this question is particularly intriguing in the case of Thrinaxodon, and is actually the subject of quite a bit of debate. One of the aspects of this organism's life appearance that has been questioned is whether or not it would have possessed a hairy integument, essentially fur. Indeed, this has been asked of all non-mammalian cynodonts in general too, and there's some interesting evidence both for and against its presence that has been considered. Firstly, implications can be made based on evidence from relatives. Specifically, a long-lived genus named Morganucodon from the Triassic and Jurassic, which has some evidence that some have interpreted as indicating a covering of fur. This evidence comes from examinations of the brain size in this taxon, with X-ray tomography indicating that Morganucodon had an expanded neocortex when compared with a typically reptilian condition which paleontologists have suggested was to allow these animals to better process tactile sensory information from a covering of hair on the body, much like modern mammals. Morganucodon is potentially classified as a true mammal, or at least a mammalia form by some researchers, but either way, it's certainly much more closely related to what we consider as mammals than Thrinaxodon is, so comparisons between the two taxa may not allow us to be especially confident about the condition in this more basal organism. Nevertheless, some have suggested that Triassic cynodonts such as Thrinaxodon may have had such integument given the evidence of later cynodonts possessing it. However, when looking at the brain structure of Thrinaxodon, it's clearly very different to what's seen in mammalia forms, being tubular and lacking the expanded somatosensory cortex seen in these other animals. Therefore, this could be an indication that this cynodont did not have any body hair and was not processing this sort of sensory information. 
In addition, a fascinating study by paleontologist Dr. Julian Benoit and colleagues has provided some intriguing evidence suggesting that hairy integument actually might not have appeared in the Cynodont lineage until much more derived forms than Thranaxodon evolved. By looking at the occurrence of a structure in the skull known as the parietal foramen, it might be possible to time the origin of hairy integument in Cynodonts. The parietal foramen is a small opening in the skull roof that is the location for the third eye, known as the pineal eye that used to be present in many different vertebrate lineages and still persists in some, including lizards and the tuatara. This pineal eye can detect variations in daylight levels and acts to aid in modulating body temperature and biological rhythms, and it seems to have been completely lost at the base of a grouping of cynodonts called Probanognathia. The interesting thing is though, that in mammals the closure of the parietal foramen has been linked to the activity of a homeogene called MSX2 and in mice which have a certain mutation of this gene that causes a foramen in the skull to be retained, there are also deficiencies in the maintenance of hair follicles across most of the body, as well as in the development of mammary glands. So, it's hypothesized that a mutation in the MSX2 homeogene at the base of Probaneognathia could have been responsible for the closure of the parietal foramen, as well as the development of hairy integument and mammary glands. Though it's noted that MSX2 does only play a role in hair follicle maintenance, meaning it's possible that such an integument type was around before this mutation occurred in the Probanognathians. What does this mean for Thranaxodon then? Well, it's placed quite far outside Probanignathia and still possessed a parietal foramen, seeming to suggest that in fact it actually did not have hairy integument as has been commonly suggested, and might in fact have been an ectothermic or cold-blooded organism. More evidence against the presence of hair in non-mammalian therapsids, the larger more inclusive grouping that cynodonts belong to, is found in the mummified remains of Lystrosaurus and Promoscorhynchus. These specimens actually preserve the textures of the mummified skin that was once present in the surrounding rocks, and no trace of hair has been preserved. Since Promoscorhynchus is a therocephalian, the sister group to the cynodonts, this is especially significant evidence against early cynodonts having any hair, though it is still possible that any remains of hair in these animals were lost during decomposition. But then again, there has actually been the discovery of a coprolite, fossilized feces, from the late Permian of Russia which apparently preserves the remains of a hair-like integument within it. Additionally, a similar discovery of a coprolite with hair-like structures has been made in the Karoo of South Africa. If this actually is hair, then there's evidence for therapsids living in the Permian that had this kind of integument, which would suggest that all later therapsids and therefore non-mammalian cynodonts did too. So for the moment it's still an unresolved problem, with some fascinating evidence supporting both sides. Related to the question of body hair is also the intriguing possibility of whiskers in Thranaxodon, and indeed other non-mammalian cynodonts. It seems to have often been claimed that the presence of many small openings foramina, in the bones comprising the snout are indications that they did indeed possess these structures, technically known as vibrissae. These foramina are actually present in a wide range of non-mammaliform therapsids, which has therefore also been suggested to indicate that a lot of these stem mammals had whiskers, which were perhaps being used for sensing at night or while navigating their burrows. However, it's been pointed out that similar foramina are actually present in all sorts of reptiles too, including lizards, snakes, and archosaurs, and it's not exactly likely that these creatures had whiskers. So what actually were the foramina in Thranaxodon and its relatives? Instead of being vibrissae attachment regions, they're actually the points at which a branch of a very important nerve called the trigeminal nerve exits a canal in the maxillary bone. This nerve branch is completely enclosed within the bone canal, and unlike true mammals, the branches do not become embedded in soft tissues of the face, which in mammals therefore allows for more flexibility of the nerve when whisking behaviour occurs. Instead, being enclosed within this canal means that Thranaxodon and certain other non-mammalian cynodonts were not capable of flexing their faces in a way that would enable whisking. Again, more evidence against the presence of whiskers in this animal. The point at which the anatomy of the maxillary canal seems to change to allow for such flexibility in cynodonts occurs in Probanognathia, indicating that whiskers most likely evolved at the root of this clade, a clade closer to true mammals than Thranaxodon's position. It's always an incredible treat for paleontologists when records of ancient behaviour are recorded in fossils, as this is often unlikely to occur. However, certain specimens of Thranaxodon preserve some truly remarkable glimpses into the everyday life of these adorable little stem mammals. It's known that Thranaxodon was a burrowing animal, as many fossils of the taxon have been discovered preserved inside the casts of these prehistoric shelters. The first example of such a fossil was described in 2003, after a remarkable specimen had been found in rocks representing what was once a terrestrial floodplain in the Karoo of South Africa. 
Interestingly, the construction of the burrow actually allowed the researchers to make some inferences about the posture held by Thranaxodon, finding that it likely moved about in its burrows in a posture much more similar to modern mammals than the normal semi-sprawling pose that non-mammalian cynodonts usually had. This is indicated by the single raised part of floor in the centre of the tunnel, which is interpreted as being due to the animals holding themselves fully up off the ground in a mammal-like stance, as opposed to burrows of more basal therapsids such as Diectodon, in which the wide and flat-floored tunnels indicate that they had a sprawling posture while navigating their burrows. The initial discovery of Thranaxodon in a burrow also led to some wider and incredibly significant implications about the evolution of cynodonts and mammals as a whole too. Many more burrows that look similar to the design of the Thranaxodon one have been identified from Africa and Antarctica, and the characteristic curled up position of other Thranaxodon fossils show that burrowing behaviour amongst non-mammalian cynodonts was not uncommon and apparently quite widespread. Additionally, the fact that evidence for cynodont burrowing is common in the Triassic aged rocks that follow the devastating end Permian mass extinction has caused paleontologists to suggest that this burrowing behaviour could have been in response to the terrible and drastically changing environmental conditions allowing these creatures to survive the worst event in the history of life while all around them entire lineages were being wiped off the face of the planet. So clearly Thranaxodon was a true survivor with its ability to burrow and endure such a destructive extinction. And the fact that early cynodonts were apparently burrowing more frequently than had been appreciated before this discovery also caused researchers to consider that this behaviour was incredibly valuable in the early evolution of true mammals, since so many mammals are still burrowing organisms even today. Another fascinating area of ongoing research and debate concerns the question of whether Thranaxodon and other non-mammalian cynodonts engaged in parental care. Specimens of Thranaxodon and another relatively closely related cynodont, Gallisaurus, have been described which show juveniles in association with an adult individual, and given their fairly close relationship to mammals, this was taken as evidence for these cynodonts looking after their young. However, since these first descriptions, more detailed analyses of known associations between multiple individuals of non-mammalian cynodonts have been undertaken, with it being found that only 4 out of the 12 specimens examined actually included an adult with younger individuals. And one of these is especially intriguing with respect to the question of parental care. This is a specimen of a cynodont called Caentotherium found in Arizona, which preserves an adult with at least 38 very young juveniles at a stage of development just before hatching. This is very significant as such a high number of offspring implies a reproductive strategy much more like egg-laying reptiles, and not at all like species that give live birth or have eggs that hatch within the body. So this is very strong evidence that non-mammalian cynodonts were still laying eggs. When compared with the other records for adult and young associations and non-mammalian cynodonts, which include specimens of Thranaxodon, there's a big difference. A maximum of only four juveniles are known to be associated with adults in these other specimens. But these other fossil associations have juveniles that are significantly larger compared to the maximum adult size of the species than the very many tiny Caentotherium babies, suggesting that they're much more developed. So it would seem that from the time non-mammalian cynodonts were the age of the very young Caentotherium until the age of the larger juveniles of other species, about 90% of the litter was apparently being lost, going from at least 38 to a maximum of 4. It's therefore been argued that this is good evidence for a lack of parental care, other than some initial incubation. Out of all the groups of individuals that were investigated, another interesting aspect was that three of these specimens represented the cynodonts in association with a different species. Therefore, there's also clear evidence that these animals would apparently sometimes share their shelters with other creatures, which could be inferred to mean that groupings of adults and juveniles of the same species might just be an example of mutualistic shelter sharing instead of true parental care. One of these associations between a cynodont and another species is a fascinating and objectively adorable fossil that preserves a Thranaxodon sharing its burrow with a Temnospondyl amphibian called Brumistega. Described in a paper published in 2013, this association was only discovered after a burrow cast found in the Karoo of South Africa was scanned using a synchrotron, revealing that cuddled up inside it were the skeletons of a Thranaxodon and this Temnospondyl. Looking closer at the skeleton of the Brumistega, the paleontologists identified that it actually had various injuries on its bones, including several fractured ribs and two small holes, one just in front of the left orbit and the other behind it. The nature of the relationship between these two individuals was the subject of a great deal of discussion in the paper, but there's clear evidence that the fractured ribs were all caused by a single crushing injury that the amphibian then survived as indicated by signs of healing, and the holes on the skull, while probably puncture wounds made by a predator, are too widely spaced apart for them to have been made by the Thranaxodon individual it was buried with, so this was not a predator-prey interaction. Instead, the hypothesis favoured in the paper is that the Thranaxodon was likely aestivating, curled up in a dormant state as it waited out a particularly warm period, 
and that the Brumistega then crawled into the burrow to take shelter after being injured by some other predator. If the Thranaxodon was not aestivating though, then clearly it tolerated the presence of this intruder, which is interesting too. There's also an indication that the burrow was actually flooded, which was possibly the cause of death of both these animals and was the reason the bodies have been pushed so close together. It's an absolutely fascinating look at a moment in deep time, forever preserved in this remarkable and pretty sad fossil, and further adds to our understanding of how Thranaxodon behaved. Now, this is actually not the first time I've talked about Thranaxodon on the channel. First of all, there was a Fossil Friday episode on it, but that's very old and cringe, so we'll ignore that. However, I also briefly discussed it in the first Walking with Dinosaurs review. Although the first episode is based on a formation in Arizona, the presence of these animals is justified by cynodont teeth that have been recovered from this locality, and then Thranaxodon was just used as a basis for the appearance and behaviour of these organisms. In my review of the episode, I said that the presence of whiskers and fur, while speculative, were not unreasonable. However, having done some more detailed research on this organism, I'd like to make an amendment to that. There's some pretty good evidence suggesting against hair and whiskers in this taxon, and so I should have made it clearer in the video that there's still a great deal of debate about the life appearance of Thranaxodon. The burrowing and egg-laying behaviour shown in the episode does obviously have evidence to support it though. However, the fact that only a small number of young are born, and that the adults are shown feeding them milk and engaging in extensive parental care, is contradicted by the current evidence we have. Again, something I should have talked about. So Thranaxodon, the ultimate prehistoric survivor, is an incredibly fascinating little creature that has allowed us some invaluable glimpses into the small moments of long lost worlds. It's also the inspiration for the name of a fantastic project we're involved in called Thrinax. Thrinax, the Therapsid Researchers Initiative for African Karoo Study, is a project that's being run by paleontologists at the Evolutionary Studies Institute of the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, and is led by Dr. Julian Benoit, author of several of the studies I've mentioned in this video. Threnax aims to run a field school for disadvantaged paleontology students at the university who otherwise would not get the chance to experience what this incredibly important part of the science is like. However, to make it happen this year we need your help, as the project unfortunately doesn't receive funding from the university, and so crowdfunding is needed instead. If the goal of 10,000 euros is reached, both Doug and I will then be invited to fly out to South Africa to join the expedition and film the whole thing to share the experience with everyone here on YouTube. We'll be going to all sorts of incredible locations, including to areas of the famous Karoo supergroup that preserve the Permian-Triassic boundary and the evidence for the Great Dying, and with any luck, we'll be able to discover fossils of the remarkable Thranaxodon ourselves. This really is such an exciting opportunity and we're so thankful to have been offered it. It's been a dream of mine to be able to go on a paleontological expedition like this, and document the experience to show people what field work is really like, and it's such a kind initiative by Dr Benoit to help his students get the most out of their studies. So if you'd like to see this happen and are able to donate, please head to the crowdfunding page linked below. Or even if you can't, please do be sure to share the link around. There are more details on the page itself and in the video I made recently about this project. I really hope we can make this happen, and with your help I'm sure we can. And thank you so much to all those who have donated already, it's been just incredible to see the generosity and the love people have for this science. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. And a big thank you to our patrons, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters Alain Bally, Amanda von Nordek, Archianthus, Bella Anderson, Dhruv Srivastava, George Vojtek, Greg Silvernail, Harry Evert, Just F. Max, Corey Peterson, Laura Sanborn, Mayer's World, Mike Pace, Persian Boy, and Staniforth Hopkins. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.